Welcome to worship at Union Presbyterian Church, whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary or are with us on our Facebook live feed. I offer thanks and praise to God that you are able to worship and connect with us today. We begin our time together with some announcements. Um, this week, here's a couple of things that are just happening very quickly in the calendar. A brief Zoom me meeting Monday at 6, a nominating committee meeting Monday at 6.30. The revelation class is Tuesday at 6.30. I think the personnel committee meeting is uh, on Thursday at 6. And we also have the sausage sandwich sale that is coming up. Today, I think, is the last day for you to put in your order forms. There are some in the back. Um, and the pickup is going to be on um, Friday. Do you guys want to do 9 to 2 or 10 to 2? I, I saw two different. You'll be here at 9, right? So between 9 and 2 is the pickup on, um, on, on Friday, October 1st for the sausage sandwich sale pickup. We had another big event this weekend. Donna, you want to talk a little bit about the rummage sale? And also a big thank you to everybody who responded to the one call to bring in some donated baked goods to the rummage sale. That the, those that were sold went to the help uh, to help the work of the deacons. And then Donna, there's a microphone there. Let me help you turn it on. We had a good week. We had a lot of fun. We had lunch together every day. And um, I really want to thank everyone that came to, out to help. Um, we made 2,785, but there's still money coming in. <laughs> and we just let people pay what they wanted, what they thought it was worth. We tried something new, and it worked. So that's going to save a lot of stickers. <laughs> and the deacons made over $300 with their food. Thank you, everyone, for your donations. If there's chairs downstairs, if you want to go see what's left, you're welcome to it. The veterans aren't coming until Friday. 
So um, if you want to come see what's left, you're welcome to it. <laughs> okay, and thank you, Donna, for organizing everything. Um, I know that it takes a lot, and thanks to the committee who helped to organize. So. Yeah, it is, it's a, it is a, a, a joyous time together. So um, are there any other announcements in the life of the church that I'm forgetting? Because sometimes that happens. You know me. Okay, looks like we're good. Let's then take a moment as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Would you please stand for the call to worship? Let our words and our thoughts be acceptable to God. The Lord is our rock and our redeemer. Let us pray. God of the universe, we gather to pray and sing your praises. Thank you for this opportunity to connect to you and to each other as we seek to deepen our faith and follow our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as disciples. We pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us say together what Christians have believed throughout the centuries as we recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. Sorry, I keep going back to the old version of the quick and the dead and the Holy Ghost. Um, but I, I am trying to learn the newer version because I think it's more accessible to people in our culture today. So sorry if I, I throw you off when I'm reciting it up here. So um, kids, come on down. They were mad at Oh, and I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I have any more trophies today, which is kind of a bummer. But hey, let's stand up and stand over here because we're still going to do something active. How does that sound? If I say, let us pray, what do you do? Yes. You pray like this. Yeah. But what if I told you that's not the only way to pray? What do you think you, do you know what? Yeah. Are you seeing some there? And did you see when we were singing that song? I had raised up my hands just like that person in the picture because I was singing and that is a form of praying because we were praising God. So I was lifting up my hands. What else do you see up there? Go ahead. Clapping. Yeah. Let's say, how about we say praise God and clap and, and I'll say, and I'll even, I'll pretend I'm a Baptist. I'll say, can I get an amen? Okay. And then we'll all clap. All right. <laughs> let's offer our thanks and praise to God. My, uh, sometimes I, I'm going to tell you something. This is probably more for the grown-ups than, than you guys. But my husband tells me that Presbyterians have a way of saying amen. And do you know what it is? They don't say amen. They go like this. <laughs> That's the Presbyterian amen during the sermon when people go. <laughs> so anyway. All right. What's another way to pray? Yes. Yep. Yeah, like that. And. Can, look at that. What's that guy doing? Yeah. Yeah. So sometimes we can pray this way too. Yeah. And sometimes in the Bible, when people encounter God, they're so afraid. Boom. They face plant right into the ground because God is a little bit powerful. Right? So some people pray like that too. So, and, and that's, that's sometimes what happens when we encounter God is we just, God is so amazing that we kind of fall to our knees. Right? So, so the next time somebody says, let us pray, it's, always, it's a good idea to do this because that helps us to focus on the words that get said. But don't forget there's other ways to pray because we can praise with our hands up. We can show God honor on our knees, and there's just lots of different ways for us to pray. So that's going to be the grown-up lesson today, but you guys get to go to children's church and have a little bit of fun. Yes, very good. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so anytime you sing a song, you can lift up your hands or, or clap your hands a little bit. Yeah, so maybe you'll do some of that downstairs when you go to children's church. So how about I say, let us pray. You pick one of those ways when, when we pray. Okay, you ready? Doesn't have to be this way. You get to pick any one of those. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks and praise. You are holy and amazing and good, and you love us. And for that, we are very, very grateful. Can I get an amen? amen. All right. Thanks, guys. Good to see you, and have fun at Children's Church. Okay. Bye. Oh, you're going to go that way? We pray a lot of different ways during our worship service. We offer praise, we sing, but another kind of prayer is a prayer of confession. So let us join together in the prayer of confession. Lord, so often we confess with our lips and not with our lives. We proclaim faith, but don't show your love with our actions. Forgive us for showing favoritism, for gossiping, 
for being selfish and boastful. Bring us back to your way, your truth, and the life you would have us lead. Hear us now as I silently confess. Now hear the good news. Christ came for us. Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ remains in power for us. And Christ prays for you and for me so that we might be connected to God. Let us say together the good news of the gospel. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, to accept the word. Silence in us our any voices but your own, so the, that we may hear your word and also do it. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We will be reading the gospel, Proverbs and Mark. From Proverbs, a wife... Uh, she makes the covering for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gates where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies merchants with ashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days and come, to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction in her tongue. She watches over the age affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her the reward she has earned. Now from Mark. Teacher said John. We saw a man driving in demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not, not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. No one who does a miracle in the na my name can, can in the next moment say anything bad about me for whoever is not against us is for us. I tell you the truth, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose in his, in his rewards. And if anyone causes one of any of these ones and believe in to, to, be, to me in sin, it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone around his neck. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell, where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter the crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the wisdom of God with one eye and have two eye, than to have two eyes and to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But it loses its saltiness. How can you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with each other. Thank you. Our gospel reading comes from James 5. 13 to 20. And um, it's continuing our gospel or our uh, sermon series on the book of James. It reads like this. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. 
Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, sick and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this is going to be the last week of our sermon series on James, and it ends with a passage on prayer. And remember, James is writing to the early church, and he's giving some them some rules to play by, so to speak. He's explaining how they should treat one another. And one of the most famous passages from the book of James is that faith without works is dead. For James, faith is more than just believing in your heart. It's following through on your faith with the ways that you interact with other people. James reminds those who are in church to welcome rich and poor alike with equal enthusiasm and show no partiality. He tells us to watch our words and not use gossip or criticism to start fires of discontent that can rage through our congregation. He reminds us to humble ourselves, to be peaceable, gentle, and full of mercy, and to reject the self-centered way of the world. And this week, he reminds us to pray and shows us that prayer is not a private act or something that only spiritually superior people are good at. James is showing us that prayer is something that we share, not just with God, but with each other. And what I love about this passage and what you saw in the children's sermon is that it offers us many different ways to pray. Ask the typical con uh, Presbyterian what prayer is, and they think, bow your head and say some long-winded, eloquent, fancy words, and that is a good prayer. But prayer is so much more than that, and it is so much simpler than that. Prayer is a conversation with God, but it's also a way of caring for one another, as well as feeding our own soul. And as I was reflecting on this passage from James, it's amazing how many of these ancient writings in the Bible find their way into our world in different ways. Because these writings on prayer are things that are part of mental health treatment today. If you go to a therapist, they may tell you some of the very same things that James tells us using different words. So let's take a look at what James is telling us about prayer. We'll start with verse 13. He writes, are any among you suffering? They should pray. Prayer and suffering seem to go hand in hand for most Christians. When we are suffering, it is prayer that can get us through. We realize when we're in difficult situations how dependent we are upon God. And that prayer allows us to feel connected to something more powerful than ourselves. It reminds us in our times of trial that God has got this and we can let go a little bit. But prayer can also help to get us out of our own heads and our own situations and circular thoughts by allowing us to look beyond ourselves. And sometimes when you're in a really hard place, it's hard to look beyond what you're facing. I think back to my time in chemotherapy when I spent many nights awake and many nights in prayer. And one of the things that I discovered is that when I only prayed for myself, it kind of made things worse because it was all about me and my suffering and what I wanted God to do for me. I focused on my misery, my sleeplessness, my nausea. 
And then one day I ordered some prayer beads. I know somebody might think that's too Catholic, but I had prayer beads. And holding them in my hands, and praying for other people brought me solace in a way that praying for myself did not. Sometimes these prayers were prayers of thanksgiving for the people in my life. Sometimes they were prayers asking God to help other people. Suffering is never good, but suffering is at its worst when it makes us feel powerless. And so on those dark nights, I would hold those beads. They gave me something else to focus on. And I would pray for the people in my life. I would pray giving thanks for God. I would just keep praying and touching those beads until God allowed me to find that peace that would allow me to rest. Prayer connects us with God and prayer is what can give us what Jesus calls the peace that passes all understanding and when we're powerless prayer allows us to feel like we can do something not because we're capable but because we have faith that God is capable and we do this all the time not even when when we're not the ones suffering but when there is a school shooting or a pandemic we pray because we know that it can do something to change the world. We pray because we trust that prayer makes a difference. So when there is suffering, we should pray. The other part of this passage says, are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. And this is a good reminder for us not just to pray during the tough times, but when things are going well. And to be honest, sometimes when things are going well, we think we've got this and we forget that we're dependent on God. And we forget to praise and thank God when things are going right. And what should we do when things are going well? We can sing songs of praise. There's an old phrase among Christians, those who sing pray twice. Singing is a form of prayer. And singing is one of the few activities that uses both sides of the brain. Singing our prayer takes us to a different place. And it, it doesn't matter if you sing well. But singing combines the words and the music. And it makes the impact more powerful on us when we sing our prayers. James reminds us of the, important, the importance of singing, and if you do online research for the benefits of singing, you'll find that it is a healing activity. Releases endorphins, it works the lungs, singing boosts the immune system, and that's for when you're singing by yourself in the car or the shower. Singing as a group like we do here at church has benefits as well as we unify our breath, as we breathe in and out at the same time. Group singing bonds us and unites us and shows us that we're in it together and that we rely on each other as we lift our praises to God. And again, it doesn't matter if you sing well or sing poorly. You are part of a, a chorus, a choir of praise that is going up to God. Now, James probably didn't, well, we know he didn't have the brain research to back up what he was telling us, but he had the wisdom to know that singing brings us closer to God and is good for us. Moving down to uh, verse 14, James gives us some more good news or good advice, and he says this, something that we may not always want to do. He says, ask for prayer. He doesn't encourage us to take the prideful, oh, I'll be fine, or the assumption that other people need prayers more than you do. You are allowed, regardless of how you're hurting, to say, please pray for me. Here's what James says. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. If you're sick or you're suffering and you're in need of prayer, you can ask for help. 
The church of Jesus Christ exists to serve and not be served. And that might mean we serve you this time. But we can't do it if we don't know that you need it. I have a little phrase that has helped me through 30 years of marriage. And it's this. If he forgets my birthday, it's my fault. <laughs> Why is that? Well, the idea behind it is that Matt can't guess what I might value, need, or want unless I communicate it to him. So if it's important to me that he remember my birthday or some other event, I need to tell him that it is important. So if you are sick or suffering or need something from this community of faith, you need to speak up. Don't ever be hesitant to ask for what you need for, or ask people to pray for you or ask for tangible help because we are all here to serve one another. And that gets us to the second half of the verse about elders anointing those who are sick. Just like singing is a form of prayer that opens up other pathways in our brain, anointing is a way of engaging other senses as well. The touch of the hand, the smell of the anointing oil, bring the words of prayer to life in a different way because we're using different senses. Even, even holding the hand of the person that you're praying for can make a big difference. The hardest lesson for some of us is to ask for prayer. The other hard thing is to be the one who prays. But some of us need to be willing to show up and say those prayers. And I know that's a hard thing because we can all be self-conscious. Will I say the right thing? Will I do the right thing? Will I sound stupid when I'm praying? But you know what? The way you intend it is the way God hears it. It doesn't matter if you stumble or choose the wrong words. Romans 8 reminds us, For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. That's a, short, a long way of saying, if you get it wrong, the Holy Spirit will intercede for you. The Holy Spirit will make sure God hears it the right way. And finally, as we think about prayer, I want to jump to verses 16 and 17. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. James knows that confession is a form of prayer that's necessary for both individuals and organizations like churches. Or you might think of it as you've got to name it to tame it. All of us have had that feeling from time to time of feeling bad about something that we have done because we all sin, we all fall short of the glory of God. Maybe for you, it was lying about a project at work and the guilt is eating you on the inside because you said, of course I sent that in before the deadline and you know you didn't. Or maybe we have had words come out of our mouths that were so cruel, we never intended them to, that, to be that way and yet we cannot find the way to say we're sorry. Or maybe we've hurt someone or stolen from someone and are afraid to admit it. Maybe we're depressed and we drink too much or eat too much. None of us is perfect, but our darkness, our mistake, and our shame can consume us, twisting us up in knots on the inside so that we become convinced there is nothing we can do to make it better and that darkness will just grow and grow and grow. James knows this about us. Jesus knows this about us. They both know about this human tendency and reminds us we don't have to carry those burdens. We don't have to carry the burden of shame. We can offload it by confessing it to someone safe. Somebody that we know won't gossip or make matters worse. Someone who can remind us that in Jesus Christ we're forgiven and we don't have to let that mistake of our past or our sin or our flaw define us and consume us. We can name it 
and Jesus can tame it. I noticed that James says we don't have to go and confess to a professional. It doesn't have to be a pastor. It can be a good friend. It can be anyone that you trust. And it takes a lot of courage to confess, not, not in the general way that we do here at church, but the true confessions of our lives take courage and strength to admit. In all of these, James is elevating prayer from words to action, from praying when you are suffering, from praising when things are going good, from asking for help or being the one to pray for someone. When we do this, we're putting our faith in action. And as I was reading this passage, I, I, wanted, I started thinking about one more thing, and that is this particular passage in light of the pandemic. If faith were just about our personal relationship with Jesus Christ, COVID restrictions would mean nothing. Jesus is with us everywhere we go. We could shut ourselves in our room and our houses and be fine. We could listen to the sermons in podcasts and still grow in faith and not suffer. But to be a follower of Jesus Christ is not just about having a personal relationship with him. It's about being in relation with other people in worship and prayer. Prayer is part of being Christ's church. Our connection is about praising and singing and praying and touching each other. We are here because we love connection and community and Jesus Christ. And for quite some time, COVID cut us off from those things that have nourished us spiritually. James knew about the impact that this could have, and that's why I think our emotional response to the COVID decisions have become so visceral and so raw, because safety and connection were at odds. Everyone experienced those hard, hard days of the pandemic differently. People who live alone were suddenly isolated and hungry for companionship. People with young adult children who moved back in suddenly had full houses and longed for space. People with health concerns lived in fear or were angry at those who didn't take their lives or the lives of their loved ones seriously with precautions. And then people in good health were mad about restrictions meant to protect the physical health of the least of these because they were healthy and they were lonely or felt restricted. We all had different reactions, but the underlying thing is that we have all suffered in some way. We've all gotten angry. We've all been frustrated. The ideas about how to end the suffering that we all experience take many different directions. People think many different things. And that's what happens when there's no easy answers. Do we protect the lives of those who are at risk or do we prioritize for singing and touching and for the mental and spiritual health of the more able-bodied? Do we care for least of these or do we put faith over fear? I don't doubt that every single one of us in this room wants what's best in the long run. We all want to glorify God and solve the challenges the pandemic has presented. And I want to just take this time to thank you all for working well together and continuing to show up and support Christ Church. But here's the thing. We are just not done. Even if the virus miraculously disappears tomorrow, we would not be done. And here's why. The divisions and resentment can remain and continue to divide us. The anger can linger, but we have a tool to deal with that. Our prayer and our connection can help us to get through it. Specifically confessing our frustration and anger to each other so that Jesus can be the one who heals it. The mental health needs and the spiritual hunger are outside but we have a tool to deal with that, and that is prayer and connection. And that's not just for those of us here, but my hope is that we as a church can connect to those who are suffering and they can't figure out why. 
My hope is that we can show them what it means to be part of the body of Christ, to welcome them into this space, to sing praises to the God of the universe. And as we reach the tail end, I hope, of the pandemic, our social skills are rusty. Our energy levels are low after a year and a half of dealing with all this, but we have a tool for that too, and that is prayer. Asking God to guide us for what really matters for this time. And we've discovered other tools of connections, tools that James, back in the day when he was writing, never imagined with our live stream and social media and website. We can reach people where they are. But these new tools don't mean anything if they are not prayerful. If we don't touch lives for Jesus in real and meaningful ways. This has been a time of suffering for almost all of us. And so we need to take it to God in prayer. You can sing here, you can sing in your car, you can sing in the shower to praise God. You can ask someone to pray for you. You can show up when someone needs you to pray for them. And don't just say, I'll pray for you. Do the prayer right there and then. Confess your sins, your anger, your frustration with all that we've been through to someone that you trust. As you heard Frank read in the gospel reading, we have the power to tame demons. And we can tame the demons that have come with the pandemic. The power of prayer can defeat the demon of isolation and anger and division and despair. Prayer can lift us out of the dark times and into the presence of our Lord. And so I encourage you, over the next few weeks, months, or your lifetime, take a few minutes to be intentional about your prayer life. Sing a praise song in the shower or the car. Join the choir here at church, which is getting restarted. Ask somebody to hear your confession. Or just pray for the people around you. Prayer is a powerful tool that connects us not just to God, but to each other. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, you give us this tool, this way of connecting so that we can fight the brokenness, the sin, the hurt, and that we can be agents of healing together. May we be a deep people of prayer coming to you to make a difference in the world. Amen. We've had a prayer of praise, we've had a prayer of confession, we have sung our praises to God. This is called the prayer of intercession, where we pray for other people and God's word. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you today in so many different kinds of prayer. We've prayed and confessed, and now we pray for those around us 
in your world and in our hearts. We ask that you hear these prayers that we lift up to you, God of mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for an end to the pandemic and the side effects of isolation, anger, division, and despair. Rid us of these demons. We pray for those who self-medicate those feelings with drugs and alcohol. God of mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord, we pray for healthcare workers and other helpers who are exhausted. We pray for conflict around the world. We ask that you show a new way of peace and that you be with those who are living in fear in Afghanistan. God of mercy. We think of Germany during its transition of power after so many years. And we also think of the places that we don't know about but that are known to you, that you will provide your, your care, your healing, and your peace. God of mercy. Lord, we pray for our children as schools try to educate them and deal with all the challenges of COVID. God of mercy. Lord, we think of those who have been impacted by the Amtrak derailment, those who have lost loved ones, those whose lives will be forever changed. We pray that you will offer your healing and your help. God of mercy. We ask uh, for continued healing for Floyd Johnson as he recovers from a fall and a knee injury. God of mercy. We give thanks for Denise's successful surgery and pray for recovery. We lift up Madeline and Chris Kristen to you. God of mercy. We pray for those who have lost loved ones, especially those uh, in most recent times uh, in our congregation, the Walton Baas and the Holmes family. God of mercy. And Lord, we pray for Samantha as she approaches her due date as well as Victoria. We ask for safe deliveries for mom and baby. God of mercy. And Lord, we lift up those who you have put on our hearts, including Kay and Jacob and family, Shanice, Gina, Nicole and families. We pray for Kenny and Steve, for Bill and Sharon, Dan, Linda and Arlene. We lift up Mary Jean and Carl and Nicholas. And Lord, we also pray not just for healing, but for thanks. We pray for Thanksgiving for a clean cancer test. Thanks for successful bypass surgery. We pray for the family of Jay Richards, who passed away this morning as well. And, for, and we pray for Jennings, God of mercy. And finally, Lord, we pray for those who are on our hearts, whom we name for you now. Lord, sometimes it feels like there's not anything we can do, but we can lift these people to your incredible care, your incredible healing power, and your incredible forgiveness. God of mercy. Lord, we remember those who cannot be with us and ask that your love and peace surround Kathy and Lois and Claire, Pat and Helen and Sherry. God of mercy. And finally, Lord, we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debt, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Lord, we return these gifts to you for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. May they be a tangible form of our prayer as we seek to share the love of Christ. Amen. are living and have lived through a challenging time and what sustains us is the prayers that we offer to God the prayers that we offer each other and the prayers of Jesus Christ interceding for us now God bless you and keep you may God's face shine upon you and give you peace now and forever as together the people of God say amen, amen.